I'm Jason Owen Smith. Uh, this, for the Monty Python fails in, fans in the room, falls under the heading of, and now for something completely different. Um, I am not a computer scientist, and I, in fact, arguably, Mike being kind enough to invite me here aside, don't really know what data mining is. Um, I'm a sociologist. In fact, I'm a sociologist of science, networks, and innovation. And I do work that, to people like me, falls under the heading of data mining um, or of big data. I'm going to talk to you at a very high level about some of it today, partially to give you a sense of how folks in my tribe think, and partially in the hopes that I will spark questions or interests from you all that will help me learn how to think better. As I begin to move around in this kind of venue, one of the things that I've learned is that relative to the state of the art, I basically hit my data with a stick. Um, so think of this as a request for help and an example of what a somewhat naive academic user might make of some of the tools that you all might take for granted. So this is the plan. I'm going to tell you a little bit about who I am and what I think. You're going to get most of this along the way. I'm going to give you a very fast and high-level introduction to two of my projects, um, both of which have to do with sort of the collaboration and innovation space. And then I'm going to pause and see if we can generate the beginnings of a discussion that I hope really will be the beginnings of a discussion. So. Actually, you can tell I initially thought this was longer, so it says two. This is evidence that I'm not really one of you. That two projects, three bullet points. There's already a fail there. It was initially supposed to be three projects, but I realized I'd never get through them in 20 minutes. So I'm going to talk to you today about what I think of as the state spaces of scientific collaboration and about a dynamic network approach to measuring radical innovation. So the first. This is work I've done, you saw my list of collaborators on the front, with a group of folks, primarily social scientists, with a few architects thrown in for good measure. Um, we're a fairly interdisciplinary bunch as these things go, so we've got psychologists, management folks, economists, myself. The overall goal um, is to try to figure out how to understand the dynamics and outcomes of interdisciplinary collaboration in big, diverse organizations like this one. We're taking advantage of a new data source, um, the sort of thing that people like me do is try to use found data wherever possible. So there's a new data source for 85 universities who need to meet the reporting requirements of the American Reinvestment Act, ARA, which dropped a lot of money into the NIH and NSF and other places. There's now data that reports at the record level grant payments for wages, vendors, and subcontractors for 85 big universities quarterly. Now to someone like me, these data, grants, PIs, technicians, graduate students, undergraduate students, look like a rectangular matrix. Grants pay people. It's easy to transform that kind of matrix into a square matrix. People connected by being paid on the same grant. This offers the possibility for the very first time of in some plausible way mapping the entire social organization of at least grant funded academic research on a broad range of campuses. And that opens up lots and lots of possibilities both for thinking about things like comparative research organization and for thinking about things like how collaboration forms, how different sets of funding policies, something like the M-cubed program here, how new facilities, buildings, shape propensities to collaborate. So what's that look like? This is actually the main component of just such a network for a single quarter for a private engineering oriented university that shall remain nameless. Red nodes here are research staff, green are graduate students, yellow are faculty. These are people who were paid on grants, the same grants, in the third quarter of 2011. We're working now to smooth out into yearly pictures and stuff. But what we did was take this data and use the grant numbers. This particular institution is dominated by NSF grants. 
And we matched those grant numbers to some topic modeling work done by a guy named David Newman at UCI who modeled the entire corpus of funded and unfunded NSF project abstracts over about a 15 year period. And that allows us to associate with these broad clusters general scientific categories. So this is a gravity wave physics group. Big, lots of machinists, lots and lots of equipment. You can move along, plate tectonics, liquid crystal, plants and DNA, the life sciences, bioengineering sort of represent the center, and you can go on and on. Ooh. What you get here is the very beginnings of the picture of what you might call the state space of collaboration at this university where the relevant states are general topic areas and the question is where are the holes? Where are the places where there could be productive collaborations that are missing? where resources are duplicated? How did it come to be the case that this university puts these topics together this way? And are there other ways at other institutions of doing it? It's one way of thinking about it. A more narrow example, this is a similar main component of a large Midwestern public university that shall remain nameless. This is a university that has a giant medical complex and the full range of professional schools. And here, there are very few NSF grants in this section of the network. These are mostly NIH grants. Blue nodes, which have been added, are clinicians, MD scientists. Here, the NSF topic modeling doesn't work, but we can reach out from NIH grant numbers to NIH data and tag these with the standardized research category and disease codes that NIH uses to report its information. Right. So we can get a sense of the state space. I'm not going to do the whole thing, but if you zone in just on this little cluster, you get an interesting picture. Broadly speaking, this group down here is essentially doing, working on two grants that are for vaccine development for HIV AIDS. This group up here is working on smoking, alcoholism, neuropathy, suicide, homeless youth, these sorts of things. There's no clear reason why one would expect these two things to be connected, except for the fact that this middle set of PIs is working on liver disease and liver transplants. Right. So hepatitis, alcoholism, and HIV AIDS tend to, res to result in liver diseases like this. This makes scientific sense, but it also raises the question, how did this particular set of connections get made on this campus, and might there be a different or better way? Is the productivity of these groups different than similarly funded and similarly configured groups that are differently connected into the state space of collaborations on their campus? So already we've got this challenge of thinking about what the state spaces are. I've been talking so far about topics, areas. You could also do institutional locations. I mentioned medical schools, engineering schools, Stanford University built a bridge between its medical school and its engineering school in the hope that it would cr help create collaboration. That points to the third state space, where we're really interested right now and why the architects are involved. I've now given away the university that shall remain nameless in the upper Midwest. <laughs> um, so, you know, please keep this to yourself. But these collaborations form and get maintained, especially the new ones, when people don't know what they're looking for in physical space, in places like this, where I get brought up to a building I've never been to before to give a group talk to a group of people who do something very different than I've done in the hopes that perhaps I will have a conversation that will lead me to think something new and interesting. And maybe you will too. Right? In other words, we have to think about the physical space of a campus or a community as a state space for collaboration. And this is one of the things that it's fairly easy for us to tinker with. Expensive, but fairly easy. So there's the campus and then there's buildings. This is a building. It's in fact this building, which many of you might have seen. You, know, you don't want to drive toward it when the sun is setting because it blinds you and you veer off the road. It's bad. The University of Michigan maintains about 30 million square feet of buildings. This one is about 470,000 square feet of research space. And if you look at it like an architect, it looks like this. And if you look at this like an architect who works with a social scientist who's interested in mapping the state space of buildings, it looks like a network of spaces that are connected by adjacencies. So you can move from one place to the other. And if you characterize the network of spaces in a building, you can begin to think about the paths people take as they walk through the building. 
during the day. It's actually fairly easy to take this and to render it down into a stylized image of two life scientists right, who each have a territory that is anchored by their offices, their laboratory space, the nearest relevant bathroom, and the nearest elevator. And we imagine that people are lazy and that they take the shortest path distance among these spaces. And that allows us for every dyad in this building, every pair of investigators, to identify exactly how much this sort of stereotypical space overlaps. And as a preliminary set of findings, when you throw this into a set of regressions that do what we can to control for things like selection and endogeneity, it's not perfect, it's pilot data. You all may have better ideas on how to do this. What we find is basically that for every additional 100 feet of overlap like this, right, you get about a 17% increase across two buildings in the base rate likelihood of a new collaboration forming, where we measure new collaboration using administrative data from DRDA for the life scientists as applied for a grant together, applied for an IRB approval together, or applied for an animal use approval together. That would not cover most of the people in this room, but it does a pretty good job of covering biomedical scientists. It also turns out that conditional on having formed such a new collaboration, 100 feet of increase in this path results in between a 19 and 22 percent, broadly, say around 20 percent, increase in the likelihood that that pair will have a collective grant funded at a three-year remove. We think this happens for two things. One, we think people who don't know each other, who overlap a lot, get to recognize each other, and they bump into each other, and they talk to each other, and sometimes they share information, and sometimes they recognize that they span one of these other state space gaps. So the one question here is how you line up the various state spaces. And then once they start trying to do new and difficult things, like generate pilot data for an NIH grant, being able to run into each other a lot allows for that sort of micro troubleshooting. When you're trying to get a new assay done, or you need to go look over somebody's shoulder and help them out with a bit of code, right? it actually facilitates getting the early stage tacit work done. And so what we're really interested in doing is figuring out how to map these various state spaces and understand them and then figure out how they lay across one another to talk about the individual and collective outcomes of research and eventually to do things like evaluate the effects of new initiatives to shape it. Right? Whether those are from the NIH or the NSF or the upper administration or your department chair, it's interesting. Our next step, and this is where we get to what I might call a data mining challenge, we actually radio tagged, actually ultra wideband, um, sociometrically tagged a group of 40 engineers who we followed for 47 days, and this is what we call the smudge plot. So we took those tracks, and any time these pairs of engineers were within 10 feet of each other for greater than five seconds standing still, we called it a fleeting interaction. Each of these dots is one of 47,000 fleeting interactions that we observed over this period. Now this poses a real challenge for the architects in our midst because almost none of those fleeting interactions are in the places where architectural and design theory would suggest they should be. <laughs> Turns out we have a lot of ideas about how one designs buildings to facilitate collaboration, but we don't actually know what works. And so that's another reason you could think about this. So here's the challenge now. We made a set of very strong assumptions in those models I showed you with the stylized path overlap. We're now using this data to try to do something that for us is difficult but might be easy for you, which is to take these data and using what's essentially a time variable continuous motion tracking stream in a continuous Euclidean plane, turn it into motion paths for individuals through spaces, categorical spaces, that we call trips. So what we want to be able to do is identify over these 40 days every time every person leaves their office and the path they take with all of the stops on the way back to where they return to it so that we can begin to understand which of those spaces, for lack of a better term, are sticky and why. So that we can induce the spaces we should use in our models and so that we can start to tell designers, hey, spaces like this tend to have people flow through them. Spaces like this tend to have people stick. We actually had a graduate student doing a dissertation on this work who spent some time observing this. It turns out the secretary in this office brings brownies. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh, but this is that she, she bakes, basically. Lots of people end up outside the office that bakes. 
right? There's a group printer up here in this office. And so our assumptions about the bathrooms may not be right. We don't actually know. We need to figure out qualitatively, but these kinds of data, particularly if we can figure out a way to do them at scale and to link them up to other things, offer new possibilities. So what does it take to do this? I won't go through the list, but we pulled together lots and lots of different data for this. So it's messy data, it's unstructured data. Some of it is like AutoCAD images of floor plans that we have to render into these networks, right? Lots and lots of effort. It's probably streamlinable. We've got five minutes left. So I'm probably not gonna get to the second project, but one data mining question that comes out of this work, one among many, is how do we do something like with that motion tracking data? Let me very quickly give you just a flavor for the others. One of the outcomes we want to know is when collaborations generate more radical outcomes. Better science, in some sense. It's the promise of interdisciplinary research. If you put different disciplines together, you all start working with me and a zoologist and we'll create something no one has ever seen before. Some of it might even be good. Right? So how do we measure that? Well, the short answer is we don't really know how to measure it. We measure something called impact, the number of times something is used, but what we should really be measuring is the effect a new finding has on the things that, the, the things that use, on the way the things that use it use its predecessors. Right? So if I publish something that destroys a field and causes everyone who would have cited architecture and design theory to instead cite me and to stop citing architecture and design theory, that's a radical innovation. But to get to that, we have to be able to conceptualize the entire evolving directed citation network, for instance, of all of the patents, which is what we did this on, in terms of these interrupted paths. We think we've figured out a way to do that. It has nice properties. It matches some broad distributional characteristics. This is an example. I'll give you one that you'll know. This is page rank, that yellow node. PageRank is moderately disruptive in this world. It cited a bunch of things, and the things that came after it early on mostly didn't cite it, but cited its prior art, and then started to cite it, and then eventually the vast majority of things started citing it, with some of them also citing its prior art. Right? So we can characterize at a patent by patent level, or maybe at a publication by publication level, this kind of measure, and we're starting to figure out if we can do it with websites, um, although there's reciprocal citation, which is rare in this kind of data. So figuring out how to do that and link it up to the topic models suddenly lets us do interesting stuff with the science. Right. I'll stop and say, it's probably two minutes left now, sorry for the blitzkrieg. I had to have an equation up there. It was a very, very simple equation. <laughs> you, know, you probably already got it, just it flashed right up. But this is how people like me think. Question? 